Good evening. It's good to see all of your faces. Yes. I love this. So I am Chanel Jones. I am one of the co-hosts of the third hour of the Today Show. Um, I co-host the third hour, but then I'm also on the earlier hours. I'm all over NBC. So I'm so excited um, that you guys have decided to join us this evening. Thank you for being here. We have a great conversation um, coming your way. So let me give you just a tiny little introduction, even though I know you guys already know, but most of you will recognize uh, one of my new favorite people, Selma Blair, from her starring roles in films like Cruel Intentions and Legally Blonde, and from big budget fantasy films like Hellboy to playing Kris Jenner mm -hmm. uh, in American Crime Story. So she can do it all, Miss mm -hmm. Selma Blair. And now, so silly. you know what's weird is somebody introducing you and you have to sit there while I say all these oh things. Oh my God, I right? love it. I'm trying to see how much more I can I know, I know. Like. We're almost there. <laughs> Show and tell. So here's why we, part of the reason why we're here. So now, after her multiple sclerosis diagnosis in 2018, this lady here is proving that nothing can stop her, literally. And to prove it, she is now the author behind this fantastic book. It's a New York Times bestseller. It's called Mean Baby. And I'm so happy I just saw a bunch of books outside. So as soon as we're finished, if you haven't had a chance to read it, it is so, so, so darn good. It's just, you'll blow through it in just a second. It's that good. So let me start with this. And this is what I will say. I firmly, let me look at your eyeballs. Mm -hmm. I firmly believe that everyone, and Selma and I have talked about this, everyone has a story to tell, right? Each of us, every single one of us is on a journey. But how many of us are really willing to tell it in a book, right? The good, mm -hmm. the bad, mm -hmm. the secrets, the things you may not want people mm -hmm. to know, things about your parents, your childhood, the things you did in your 20s that you were so happy there was no social media when you were in your 20s. Um, and that's exactly what she does. I mean, it's so honest. Um, I really, I couldn't put it down, so I'm looking forward um, to talking to you about, about your book. Um, and then also, I think it's important to talk about the takeaways and the message uh, that you'd like to share with all of us in this room. Um, so let's take it one step at a time. Uh, before we dig into the book, you saw. Let's talk about how you're feeling in this moment. So I know with MS sometimes you have to take it a moment at a time. How are you in this moment? How are you feeling? Thank you so much. It always helps me to kind of inform people where I am. And um, this has been a great few days here, exactly what the doctor ordered. If I had a doctor that had a lot of money to give me to live here forever. Because <laughs> it is such, a, such an incredible place to get away and lay my eyeballs on green makes mm such a difference truly um i'm 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 doing really well i haven't i'm in remission um easy for me to say but i'm gone i'm in remission um from from ms that was really active and for many years and i had a bone marrow transplant and i am so much better but i am still very glitchy. Yeah. And it can be very off-putting. But I am perfectly fine, despite it sounds like I have hiccups coming in and out sometimes. But here's I the thing. I don't, I don't know if you can feel it, but there's loving energy in this room. So you have a hiccup. We're all here for it, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So you just hiccup all you want. All right. So you just had a birthday. We didn't even talk about this yet. I'm you just 50. had a birthday. She just turned 50, July or June 20, June 23rd. <laughs> I feel like, well, obviously 50 is a big one, but you, considering everything you've been through, I mean, was this a special one for you? Did you celebrate? Did you I mark celebrated. it? I celebrated. I never thought I'd make it. Let me start out with something really light for you guys. Okay. Just <laughs> I, I was a terrified person, terrified of life, totally overwhelming and very hard to get to the living part. I kept saying, like, when I grow up, when I do this, when I have a point of view, and and I really let my life, not with any regret, tons of regret. Um, <laughs> we'll get to that. You know, get, to write, I'm sorry, I'll be with you in a second. What was I talking about? This no, is I just, joke. you're, you're it's like my new no, it's okay. You've been celebrating 50. Thank you. Okay, so it was, it's, a, it's a good moment. It is. It's a great moment. 50 sounds real. I never, thought, like, 50 is really a, a grown-up. Mm. So I mm. feel, um, yeah, I feel relieved. Yeah. I feel relieved. I earned it. Like enough, you know, enough time Absolutely. has gone by. The trial and error that I'm finally like, okay. You earned I've, it. I've earned a spot. Yeah, I can feel like maybe. So a lot of us remember uh, when you announced that you had MS 
And of course, I don't know if you guys remember that red carpet moment, right? I think it was a Vanity Fair uh, Oscar dinner and you wore this fabulous gown. I talked to you about this, this fabulous cane. She was so regal. Um, and even though we know it may have been tough at times probably to walk on that red carpet, but it was such a powerful moment on so many levels. And that alone was so brave and so healing to so many people who also suffer. Um, I was telling her, I have a really uh, dear friend, one of my best friends has been suffering quietly with MS for a really long time. And she's an influencer, so she didn't want, you know, she wants to be on Instagram with her dresses and her bathing suits or what have you. And when Selma walked that red carpet with that cane and as fabulous as she looked, mm -hmm. she called me and she was like, you know what? She can be sexy with the cane, so can I, you know what I mean? So it was so healing for so Thank many people. You. You know, yeah, it's such a little thing to show up. You know, it's like, well, what are you bringing? You bring a dress, a cane, but it does. It moves the needle. I mean, all of us that are in this gorgeous setting, we all know gorgeous things, things mm -hmm. we create, thoughtful. You know, everything moves the needle. And I had no idea, you know, the love that was given in this cane to me. Everything it was my first time out. I was in a terrible flare. It turned out my flare was years long. That's why it had kind of hit so hard. Like, it had been active since my son was born. It hadn't remitted in, you know, like eight years, mm -hmm. and I didn't know. So it was, um, it was hard to get out, and I always used to wearing heels because I'm short, and so I liked to wear heels, and there was no way to do it, and of course I was using a cane all the time. Am I doing a weird voice thing with this? Is it okay? Good. You remember <laughs> being on that carpet with the, the, the yeah, yes. take that off. No, I did, and everyone, it was the first time that photographers, paparazzi stops that had given me any, you know, even though I'd been kind of, you know, bumming around that town for a long time, there was something. I needed that moment because I just technically couldn't walk and they all put their cameras down and they cheered the same oh. ones that would, you know, be kind of looking for the harder spot. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a real awakening for me to realize what support meant. Mm. I lived my life very isolated. I drank from the age of seven. It's in the book. But I'm getting there. Um, but I really uh, kept a big distance from me and kind of everything around me with a little numbness. Mm -hmm. And I was very high functioning alcoholic until I wasn't. Let's dig in there then since yeah. you since you brought it up. So you you're on this red carpet, that put it out there, right? Then you drop this documentary and the book. And there were moments, if you haven't seen it, it is worth the watch and of course the read. I mean, there were moments where you were in such anguish and agony and there are also triumphs. I mean, where you were back on, you know, riding on a horse. Talk a bit about this season for you and why you're putting it all out there. Why now? <sighs> when I did get the um, diagnosis, it was amazing. I was so happy. Why? Because I'd always felt bad. And that was the thing that, um, that I realized that was the miracle. I'd been searching my whole life, since I was seven, in hospitals, I lost my bladder function, I lost an eye through optical neuritis, like my vision, narrow, and um, never diagnosed with MS. And everyone just said, you're so dramatic, and I am dramatic. But it was, so it fit, so I didn't know which was- affirming that it wasn't in your head. Right, but I, that was it. That is it. I did not trust myself my whole life, because, I would walk around in the house and um, I couldn't control my bladder. I was made fun of. I mean, it wasn't, I didn't have such a hard time with cruelty towards me growing up, um, but just my own family and wanting to be with them. And, and when you have a chronic illness, especially when it's not diagnosed, it's not affirmed, um, people get really pissed. And that's what it's like when you get older. That's what it's like when you have an injury. You are now someone that is having to mind your body more. Mm -hmm. And abilities are fleeting. Mm -hmm. If we are lucky enough to live old enough, we will find all sorts of things, you know, fall apart and, and we must maintain them in yeah. a different way. And to know that I was like everyone else, because I really did just think, I don't know why I can't hold my leg or feel it. I, and I was convinced it was totally psychogenic. Mm. And so I drank more. And when I would drink more, you can be kind of reckless Absolutely. and horrible. So everything changed with that diagnosis because it let me trust myself. Makes sense. So with that said, let's dig into the pages of Mean, Barry, or mean Baby. I have to admit, 
At first, I didn't know if the two words would go together. I'm like, mean baby, is that a thing? <laughs> now, obviously, I've read the book, I get it, but can you explain to everybody where the title came from, mean baby? Well, um, my mom had me at um, 8.45 on a Friday morning so she could be back to work in court. She was a magistrate in Detroit um, by Monday. I was the fourth. I didn't have a name when I was born because they were probably waiting for someone to die um, in the Jewish tradition, which someone's relatives were in somewhere, so you, you wait until someone dies. My mom's best friend died eventually, and I got her name, Selma. Um, but I don't have a name on my birth certificate. Mm. And um, they, the neighbor kids came over to meet the new baby. I was the fourth, three older girls, and they went running out saying, don't go over there, the Bightoners have a mean baby. Mm. And they told everyone, and it stuck. Wow. And I kind of liked it because it made people a little afraid of me, mm. so at least there was like a little respect. Interesting. Um, well, it makes sense. But then someone brought up to me that mean baby is also, now that I've changed my tune a little, mean baby is also numerical, like, you know, accurate, like the mean amount of something, okay. or like, that's a mean baby. Uh, you know, I mean, there's so many different ways of looking at something that's, that's like, wow, it never occurred to me in my life. I like that. So there's so much we could dig into about your childhood, your early acting days, Hollywood. Uh, but I think we can better understand where you are today if we look at your childhood, like you've been talking about. So there were some moments in the book that I picked out that still stick with me, um, and they have, and they probably will for some time. So first, you talk about how, as a child, you craved attention. I want to read a little bit about a time when you were at a birthday party um, for a boy in your daycare, and you told everyone that you lost your earring. I think it was in her pocket. This was a real mean baby yeah. thing. So I think it was in her pocket. But keep in mind, this is daycare, right? So I was blown away with what she was able to pull off at such a young age. She talks about the fact that the mom was on the floor at this birthday party looking for this earring. And you say, when she should have been enjoying her son's party, everyone spent most of their time searching. You say, when my mother came to pick me up, the boy's mom approached her, calmly promising that they would try to find the earring. Selma, what on earth, my mom cried. And then your mom said, she didn't lose her earring. She's a liar. The jig was up. And then you write, looking back, I think I was jealous of how much that mom loved her son. She put so much effort into throwing her beautiful boy a suitably beautiful party, and I wanted the warm glow of that kind of attention to be lavished on me. I longed to understand how that felt. I thought there needed to be an emergency to get attention, and in the absence of a real emergency, I manufactured one. Yeah. I mean, it seems silly, but as a kid, it is, my mother was everything. I idolized her. And I realized I really had a pattern. I saw I had lost my earring a long time ago <laughs> and, and kept it out because my teacher, my kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Zigelman, noticed I didn't have it one day, but I kept the other one in. It was the age of turtlenecks. They always pulled those starter earrings out. <laughs> and and um, mm -hmm. so she said, where's your earring? And I said, oh, I lost it. And she thought I must have lost it in the room. And I didn't correct her when she immediately started, you know, moving hell in high water for me. And no one had ever done that to the mean baby. Mm -hmm. So when I went to my first birthday party um, for this little boy, and his family adored him, and I adored him, and his friends were so nice. And I just wanted to, Attention. I didn't know. Yeah. I was a kid. You were smart But it girl. cemented me as a cruel, narcissistic, mean baby. And I kind of, it, mm. it was for a sensitive person, it's amazing what you'll then build to kind of keep that drama that's giving you something. And yeah, yeah. There's another part of your childhood that followed you into your adult years, and you just touched on it. We can dig in now. Um, and that is alcohol. Now, I will say, you're not, you have not had alcohol for some time. Mm -hmm. um, and you have so many reasons. You've got your beautiful son. <laughs> so many reasons why you've chosen to stay sober. But I was blown away when you write about being seven years old, having your first drink. Or you talk about being, can you imagine fourth grade? Like, I have two fourth graders. I was in second grade. You second know, grade the first time. I found my journals. I, I wonder if everyone else has something like, I mean, it's, everyone seems so shocked. You were seven, and I was like, well. Well, because most seven-year-olds, first of all, it would be gross. It would be disgusting. Or you'd be worried about, like, you know, somebody finding out or 
you know, authority. I think that's the problem of being the baby. I mean, the whole thing, they were, they were professionals. And I was, you know, came from a kind of privileged family and you just oversee it and you learn as, as an addict to, even at seven, to keep, you know, really protect the thing that's gonna keep you feeling okay. So did it numb you? I don't know, I think it helped me feel. I don't know, maybe passed out, people were, ex you know, all the older kids, oh, Blair can, you know. Blair can do drink 10 beers, you know, and I was like eight, and um, you know, she can shotgun 10 beers, and I felt powerful. And this book was really, um, you know, people knew those things. I was gonna I ask you, to, did people notice? <laughs> there was a time uh, that my father did notice, and uh, that it got so bad, but I drank in front of them. I mean, I had a, I had a mother that was very kind of European, mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, it was like, oh, in France, the kids drink wine, you know? So every night at the dinner table, it was like, oh, Selma, have a glass of wine. They knew I enjoyed it. They didn't know that I would always go back mm -hmm. to the refrigerator, you know, even at the age of seven. As soon as I found out that it was wine and not God making me feel warm, mm -hmm. the Passover Seder, I was, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. And my life then was full of shame and self-loathing. Um, once I would get myself into things. So this book really was a look at meeting those places that were very intimate and personal and being very vulnerable because people would, people have killed themselves mm -hmm. um, for less than I've done or seen or been um, with the shame. And I think that's why I said And it was I think it's important healing. to say, yeah. you know what, there, there can be another side. There you, can be a shift. There is a choice for a lot of things. You talked about your mom <clears throat> and um, the love for her is so deep in this book. It's so clear. And I know it's complicated. And you talk about how much you admired her strength and her fashion sense. Um, but she could also be really tough, as you talked about. And another moment that grabbed my attention um, when you landed on the cover of Seventeen magazine. Do you guys remember Seventeen? Yeah. And it I was mean, a for big any of us deal. in this room, if you land on the cover of Seventeen, like life made, like that's it, right? I mean, you kidding? That's that's enough. <laughs> um, and then you write that after you landed on the cover, you called your mom and she said, "You look so unimportant. Mm -hmm. You're going to come home and get a real job." And then you also write, "There is always one person who gets under our skin." who knows our weak spots and can't help but to go in for the kill. They are the people who wound us the most because we care so much about what they think. For me, that person is my mother. Yes, I mean, to be fair to her, she was very hard, she was very tough, um, but she was so much fun and she was beautiful and she was smart and to me it's still, it's worth it. I mean, now with perspective, now that, thank God, I am more focused on wanting to enjoy this very short life we have, um, I, you know, I, I, I don't begrudge her at all, but as a child, I, I, don't, I don't know how you deal with wanting the one person. It sounds so simple, but it's so, it's so universal. No matter, you know, if, if you're the most powerful businessman or woman or, you know, someone in a war with very immediate things to think of, it's, it always is with so many people, that mm -hmm. mother love, that mother, that, she was my person, and she, was, she didn't want children. You know, she got knocked up at the age of 40. <laughs> 40. You know, <laughs> you know it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, we were talking this morning, look, I'm a mom of three. I have two soon-to-be 10-year-olds and a soon-to-be 13-year-old. And I think about how I want to be as a mom, right? And I think a lot of us as parents, if you're parents in this room, you take the good stuff and the things that your mom or your, as a father, the things your father did that you want to continue and the other things that you want to change, you try to. Um, and so for you, what about for you? I mean, the only thing son. that was important to me, the only thing that felt important to me as a mother that is when I died, I wouldn't be drunk. That, that, for a long time, I considered, and I would pray to God, and I'm so open about this, not to confess I've made peace, but for people that have people with addictions in their lives, or children, or, I don't know, it could befall my son. He could find himself in it. I have no idea, and I still would feel unequipped how to help him. Mm. But I, um, 
I, I fell apart this whole life. You know, it really, I was really struggling, and, and I'm sure there's more to come. Um, but I am, you are really I am okay good now. There's a scene in your documentary. But I just wanted to not be drunk, and it was harder than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd be sober for four years, go back. And, and that was so important for me to own that totally. I never hid my drinking. I was never a liar about it, ever. I didn't, I was very functioning, but I didn't socialize. I wasn't a partier. That's why people didn't hear of it too much um, when there was a time when it was out in paparazzi because I knew from the age of seven that I could not handle it well when I would overdrink. So I only drank alone, usually. And then comes so, <laughs> so then my comes son along. came, yeah. and I was alone a lot. No, but I didn't, so I didn't drink. But then push came to shove, and I wanted everything to be the best mom for him, but I didn't know I had BMS, so I was dealing with a, a lot of things. This isn't at all for like a sympathy thing. It's just an understanding, once you have a different perspective, um, how totally lost I was, and I was exhausted, and I was, again, sober once my son once I was pregnant, and, um, and I stayed sober for almost three years with him, but I still never had, I was always faking it. I mean, I was really sober, but I didn't have any real peace. Yeah. And, um, you had an and, I, and I had an incident that was, um, I, I cannot believe that I choose to ever bring up this incident, but I do because cause it happens and people uh, lose their lives when they have a humiliating experience, especially if it involves drugs or alcohol. And I, I took my my uh, son and his dad on a trip, and I, the room had a full bar and all inclusive. Totally not my deal. That is not the type of I'll stick to boutique hotels. But all inclusive, <laughs> it gave a lot of leeway with the bar. So um, I lost it. Everything that I had done my whole life, I finally did the biggest sin ever. I'm a mom that lost it. And no one hates anyone and is afraid of anyone as much as a mother who loses it. And that was my biggest fear. And I, and I got drunk, and I didn't eat, and I was spent that trip. You know, and, and not huge drama, but just knowing as a mother, I am drunk in a bed with my son, with his father, thank God. But it was the first and only time that I was ever drunk with him. And I lost it. And I could have died, and I... I um, but you know what, though? I lost it on the plane going back, yeah. and I and, uh, lost consciousness and, and had a whole thing, and someone photographed it, and as you do, it was the hard side of being a celebrity. And when I woke up in that hospital room and the doctor told me what happened, and I immediately changed. It was all over for good. It was the gratitude that I did not kill someone mm. when I have no recollection, and the gratitude was like, <clears throat> right now, you are going to be honest about everything and um, for your son, break that cycle. And also, because people can be so cruel, and I see, and again, I, I, I keep saying this, but people really lose their lives over that kind of shame of public humiliation or fearing they just did something that can't be excused. And, um, and it was the first time in my life I said, I won't, I won't kill myself. And you haven't had a drink no. since? No, no. You haven't had a drink since. Nope. And I will win. never touch alcohol. Yeah. Alcohol is not for me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That dance so, card is full. There yeah. was this moment in the documentary. I was like, ooh, you love the card as a mom. <laughs> there are a lot of moms, a lot of parents who won't get down on the floor. And there's nothing wrong with them. They just don't mm -hmm. do it. You will. There was one point after your, in your documentary where you could tell you were hurting and you were wrestling with your son. I think you guys were playing dodgeball. I mean, it's all I, it, it's, you're in it's it. everything I have. And I think because sometimes I feel I don't give a lot because sometimes uh, keeping out with a day physically can be really demanding. I'm a bit of an older mom, although so many people do it now, but you know, I'm 50 and my son's 10 and I have a mess and, um, you know, and a lot of, and a lot of stuff. And, and, uh, so I do kind of, I'm kind of all or nothing. You're such a good mom. You know, it's a lot, <laughs> like when I'm here. She's a good mom. She's FaceTiming <laughs> with him today. You're a good mom. Thank all you right. very much. That means yes. so much. No question. All right, so, so this memoir is about okay. growing up. <clears throat> so let's move forward in time a little bit. So there's this chapter. It's called Bite Me. <laughs> <laughs> so I will say this. So before that, there's a part in the book where I think you're like three years old, you're jumping on the bed with your sister, as we do, and for no good reason that she said she could recall, 
she, you bite your sister. Yeah. Um, you sink your teeth into her back. Um, she forgives you, and kids, yeah. kids bite as they do. But this is the part that I am still, see, I touch my head because I'm still trying <laughs> to figure it out. You were biting again sometimes as an adult. Well, because I was drinking. So, but, face it. Yeah. So, um, like, there would be people, when you buy, buy the book, you'll see, like, celebrities. Like, and you would, like, bite them lovingly, kind of. Yeah, you know, I come, it's a different generation, and I'm going to wrap that biting up. I do. I don't do it. I am Well, there was one model who, bite, like, bit you back. Yes. Kate Moss. I was like, oh, such a crush. Like, hangs the moon for me. I'm hanging out with her. That's right. I'm, I'm not dropping a name, but I... I, you I know, see, I was, I was gonna say model. I didn't say I was that. well into my cups this evening in London, but I, I did go through a stage. I'm very awkward, maybe you've noticed. And so I um what why does this I bite? Out? I don't know. It's like it's just um this isn't like I'm not giving any of you rocket science information. This is like a really personal thing to understand someone you might really abhor. That would be me. Because no. I am the girl. <laughs> no, but I am, I'm the girl always, ever since I was little. They'd be like, oh, yeah, you're that weird girl. And I'm like, why does everyone say that? And then hence I realized, um, I bet I bit uh, Seth MacFarlane. I bit... Um, she bit them. Because I thought, you know, it's like... Is that like, hey, I love you? Like my dog. Do like, yeah. Like, like, it wasn't a bite. Like, um, love we're going to end this night. And yeah. it's going to be... It's gonna be tricky because you know you gotta run for me. No, it was it was like, oh my god, I love you, yeah. You're funny, uh, but no more biting. For saying so, no yeah, more no, biting. They, no, no more biting. It's horrifying. I thought I'd put it in there before people um started like talking. You know what? It's fine. I think, like I said, you put it all out there. But that was the one part where I was like, I know she's, I know, like, I she's won't misunderstood, do that. but I don't understand. I don't. I know. I was admitting. <laughs> I was admitting. There's nothing to understand there. There's I no reason that. for lovingly biting someone. But I did it until this model. She laughed the first time, and then I was like, oh, she laughed, she's so good. And then she like, you like hit my back and like bit me back, as she should, and I've never bit anyone That's since. That's so funny. Hurt. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've apologized. I've made real amends to all the people I've bitten. Here's the thing. You're also, with that said, a really good friend. Uh, so despite all the challenges over the years, look, your talent was and is clearly present. Um, so let's skip to your Hollywood days. Um, so I know you're close to Sarah Michelle Gellar. A lot of you may remember the kissing scene from Cruel Intentions, but what is it about her um, that led to what has been a lifelong friendship with the two you know, of them? You know, I idolized her even ever since she was on, um, like, All My Children. Huh. You know, it was like she was a kid, and she was, you know, she's a very, she's a together person. There are some people that start their lives together, like, as, like, capable people. I, I didn't, like, get that exact blueprint, mm. but she knew it. And when I meet those people, I'm like, I'm sticking with you. <laughs> I'm sticking with you and, you, and you. and I've managed to have mm. the most amazing friends. She was actually supposed to come here, but she got COVID. No. And she loves you and your friendship. For sure. I know. She does. Thank you. I love it so much. Yeah. No, there's good stories that could come out of Hollywood. Yeah, for sure. Do you remember those days? I mean, look, I said earlier, you know, you guys had paparazzi, but you didn't have Instagram. There's no Snapchat. Aren't you so happy? There's no social. But I like, do you remember those we had days? Film. I mean, people have high def. I mean, it's awful. It's awful. Remember, you could take a picture. Oh yeah. Do you remember and those you days? Could fondly? Stand to look at yourself. Now you take a picture, and it looks like something's happening from like the oral surgeon on your face. Like, yeah. It's so yeah. It's so like specifically. <laughs> intricate. That season, what was that like for you? You guys were like the Hollywood. I loved it. I loved being in that. Hollywood. It was the last era, I feel, of kind of the John Hughes, the teenage storytelling, realizing, um, you know, I mean, the movie that I was so lucky to be cast in was obviously the remake of Dangerous Liaisons, which is such a, you know, classic and good, juicy story. And then this was remade for teens. I mean, amazing and wrong <laughs> and great. So I was already 25, though, 24, playing young Cecile. Mm -hmm. It was like 14. Yeah, yeah. So the only way to kind of make it not um, too victim hoodie was to make her, like, really obnoxious. Mm. 
and it worked. Worked. So and, and <laughs> throughout your your early years and into your adulthood, you talk about how sometimes you would have these pains, and you talked about it just a second ago. It would be a pain in your leg, or you had a fever for like. I was a fever patient. Okay, this is we're all like I wanna. Oh. You guys, are you upset? You're like, why did I step in here? No. The truth is because you're like, what is she talking about? The truth is I was so, I was sick. I was yeah. sick all the time and I was a fever, um, like a patient, a fever of unidentified origin. And I was like literally checked into the hospital for months and they're trying to figure out all these You're tests. a child, so you don't have to apologize for it. No, I know, but I, it was, it, it really defined me that everything was not feeling well, but also not having a name for it. So. I was making it up. Do you think all that time it was like a red flag for MS? Every single thing was by the book MS. But I didn't know a thing about MS. And in fact, I was told by a doctor at 23, you have optical neuritis. Do you have MS? No. Okay, but <laughs> like I didn't realize. Oh. But then when I went to the neurologist, they didn't, um, they never took an MRI. I went to the neurologist after that appointment with the doctor, as anyone should when someone says they have something alarming. But I didn't understand MS at all, and maybe the doctor didn't either because it can relapse and remit. You know, I was yeah. in a, um, a rehab when I first found out, which was coincidentally the right place for me. But I found out, you know, that I went to a doctor appointment. My dad took me and Leonard Lerner and said, I had a, you know, do you have MS? No, I don't. Well, you should see this person. Went to the doctor. Why are you here? Uh, optical neuritis. He looked no longer optical neuritis. I don't know what the problem is. Boom. And he didn't even do an exam. He just looked in my eyes and said, you don't have it. Well, with MS, it comes and goes. So an MRI would have been nice considering also my medical history. Yeah. It was like this long searching for something. So it was an interesting case as I found really that it is tricky for a woman to get diagnosed with something that's chronic. Mm -hmm. And then I find the men, and this is not bashing men, it's just that there's a lot of baggage that people see when they look at a woman or doctors or hear a lot or maybe the data the hormone. Shows you know, you don't know, oh, you have your period, you're pregnant, a lot of things that men doctors can't relate to. So it's just kind of soft in that, and I find the men are diagnosed very quickly, and I went a whole lifetime with very classic signs, and if any, when I finally did get an MRI in 2018, because I went to a doctor, I had to get on a plane, I couldn't move anymore. I mean, it was hurting so bad, I'd been sober for a couple years, and I thought, oh God, it's not just the drinking that's making everything inflamed. And I had to go back to work, and I put it on social media, and this is where social media is amazing. <laughs> Some people see it, and they can kind of tell. Hey, I think something's Some, wrong. I said, I'm, I have to go back to work, and I really can't move. I must have sciatica. The leg won't work, and my neck. I can't sit on a plane. There's no way I need to find a doctor that can give me a steroid or something. So I went to my, my general. He knows for 10 years. I've said, I'm so tired. I can't wake up. He's like, you're a mom. And... Um, so I got the MRI, and at, I, I went into his office, and he looked at it, and he said, before the MRI, this doctor who's a spinal neurologist I finally get sent to for my bad back or neck. And he said, I think, I'm looking at it, and yeah, you're old. You have, you know, you have stenosis, maybe a surgery, but like nothing would correlate to what you're, you know, presenting. And I just said, yeah, I guess that's it. Like, I just, wow. I guess that is it. I'm sorry. And so I went and laid down on the table right there and I fell asleep. And he said to my boyfriend, does she always do that? He's like, oh yeah, she just, if she lies down, if she stops talking, she falls asleep. So he had me stand up. I've been to maybe 20 neurologists. Had me stand up and do a simple Romberg test. Don't worry, I won't do it and fall. But just shut your eyes. My feet together and my arms out. Shut your eyes. I had no idea where I was and I fell totally. Like there was no proprius, no, it's a very classic easy thing to do. And immediately he said, oh, you gotta get, you gotta go to the emergency room and get an MRI. And so when I got in, he called me right away and said, <clears throat> your, you know, your brain is covered, it's everywhere. It doesn't always matter how many lesions you have or anything. It doesn't necessarily correlate, but it was the first time that I was like, <gasps> So, like, I, I thought I had to cry because you're supposed to, but I was so thrilled 
that there was, that I was real and that I wasn't making everything up and it changed everything and it changed my need for attention. Mm. I mean, you might still think so because I, I love connecting even if, you know, but it was, um, mm. it was a game changer to feel seen. You know what I learned and a lot of us will learn and we talk about it all the time even on the show, you have to be your own advocate. How many times have we talked about that? And I feel like that's what you did. I didn't know. You, yeah, I finally did, but I didn't know for, I, but I, I didn't know how to be my own advocate. I didn't know. I read the PDR and would learn everything, but I was always led to psych, mm. like every doctor. So that's what I studied, mm. you know, my abnormal brain thinking. Yeah. You know, so I was always looking, but it was always, I was looking you know, for healing or psychiatrist or story or, yeah. you know, I, I don't have anything to be sad about. Why can't I stay awake for a day? Why can't I be a part of it? Why can't I be with people? Why, if I stand up, I can't talk, but if I sit down, I can. Mm. And um, so everybody's MS, we've talked about this, and you may know people with MS, everybody's case is different, right? Everybody has a different situation. So I know that when you had that stem cell surgery, everybody, for people who have MS, were hoping it was like, you represented hope because they see you now and they're like, wait, it worked. That, Can you talk a little bit about that without going too deep into it? But I mean, you were really sick there. For you know, time. I was always told, um, whenever you hear about it, like Parkinson's or MS or bigger ones, you know, these neurological things, there is no cure. And, um, and it can get, you know, especially if you can get wiped out, tense, dehydrated, whatever, life, it, it, it crews and there's no cure. So I, there's disease modifiers, and so I couldn't take any of them. I got encephalitis, like PML, like it just wasn't wasn't gonna work, anaphylaxis, or it didn't take down my lesions. So someone, again, on Instagram found me and said, you're really not doing well, and she came over, and she told me about a stem cell transplant, which is really just an autologous bone marrow transplant, and you harvest your own bone marrow, and then it's cured by chemo, you get enough, you know, you have a blade of chemo to totally wipe out your immune system and then it re-engrafts when they introduce the stem cells, the bone marrow. And they, they've been doing it, you know, obviously for people with leukemia and all these things, but to do it for MS or lupus or, um, you know, stiff, uh, there's all these, you know, huge, huge diseases, problems, syndromes. So, um, but kind of mission accomplished? It was mission accomplished, it put me in remission, absolutely. I have no lesions growing now, and hopefully I won't. Hopefully I'll keep myself calm in my nervous system. But I do have accrued damage. I have volume loss in my brain that you know gets like little traffic stops. And I do enjoy being someone that is uh, a visible person with you know a form of you know something that that um, you know might be misunderstood. I know I've gone on like Daily Mail comments. I don't know. I shouldn't admit it. That's yeah, like why, bigger. Girl. That's like bigger than admitting I'm an alcoholic that is like, and got like, drunk. That's that I read a comment, but I do. But but I also read it. I, think you should I, not. I don't hurt by it. No, no, no. I'm admitting this because I actually use it because I I like to see see what people think. This isn't a I hate Selma. Like I'm not looking at comments to punish myself. But I, I look for writing ideas and what's out there, and I'll read a comment every once in a while. You know, what does the average troll think? Because um, usually it's not really the people I care about their opinions, usually. Um, but it's a lot, and it really triggers me. And this is something really with a lot of people with invisible or chronic or just all of us, if we have trauma, whatever. You know, she's faking it, the, you know, oh, she shaved her head. I mean, so many people, oh, she suddenly cured. One day she can go out and one day she's, you know, with a cane or can't speak. Oh, and she wants to look gorgeous, she'll go out and try. But the rest of the time she wants attention and it's a lot. And I'm okay with that. But um, like I could read it on mean tweets or whatever on Jimmy Kimmel and I don't go searching for it, but it is to realize how many people, there, people are treated like that all yeah. the way, you know, all the time with things that are, you know, go with our emotional, you know, rhythm. Yeah, you use the word emotion. So what do you do now when, like, so before when you were triggered, you would go to destructive behavior. How do you cope now when you get stressed? Especially when we it know has, stress aggravates MS. You it's know? been a big learning thing to really not even want a drink. 
Um, <laughs> you know, because there was always that thought of, oh, I could have relief yeah. sometime. Yeah. You know, maybe I could control and have relief just somewhere. Right. Just a sip, you know, and I did that enough in my life to get nowhere good. But I, something really changed from support of people and understanding and then understanding myself better. Mm -hmm. It was a self-trusting thing and I don't, it's okay for bad things to happen. I mean, there's levels that I, you know, but it's okay for bad things to happen and still be okay. It's weather. It's, yeah. I don't know how to teach my, my son doesn't have depression, anxiety the way I did, so I cannot relate to him at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I was like, I'll have so much to teach him. He could give a shit. That's such a win. He, immediately, good. he's like, I want a good life. That's I'm not good. Stupid. That's good. It's great. I was looking at your, it's, it's like my greatest achievement. Yeah. That I have a totally. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at your, your Instagram page last night, and you're so kind and so passionate, and people look to you with so much hope. Do you feel like you're in a good place? I do. I mean, we all are. Let's face it, we're here right now. I think of that every day. I'm not at all trying to be a Debbie Downer, Deborah Downer, mm -hmm. <laughs> by saying, you know, we know that we, if we're lucky, we can create our life around us. If we're so lucky or blessed or on a, whatever people call it a vibration or the people or family wealth or whatever, you know, there's, there's, there's so many safeties for some people, but the truth is we just all have this life <laughs> and we all have our emotions and maybe some people are terrified like I am half the time, but um, that is the thing that is universal to me, that I look at you and I'm like, we're, we're fellow earthlings. Like it's so weird when I think of how weird it's true, but life is yeah. sometimes. Like we all have these these massive emotional stories probably, and um, of course. And, and it's just as important as the really basic needs and, and hierarchies that need to be put in place in life for safety and keeping our earth cleaner and All creating this utopia. Like Aspen is such like the utopia. And it's like, how can we all feel like we can create that in our own communities to some degree? You know, and we all do deserve to yeah. have beautiful things and health and all of those things. Deserve what's yeah. deserve life. Well, happens, there, there's but, you know there's no, nothing wrong with wanting a so wonderful life. 100%. To enjoy your days. Absolutely. There's more in your book that we couldn't get into tonight because we want to take some of your questions. But I mean, she deals with really heavy challenges: suicide attempts, sexual assault. I mean, depression. Any one of those things could knock somebody down for the count. But here you are. <laughs> I'm so happy. On the other side of it. Oh, I'm so happy I'm not in jail. <laughs> you know? On the other side of it. Right. What would you say, Selma, to someone, and who knows what anybody is going through, but someone who is in darkness at this point, to get to the light? Like, what gives you hope? Like, I mean, any advice, any words of wisdom? I mean, for me, it can now be as simple as, like, you know, I mean, I really did change. For me, it's looking at, you know, the color green on a hill. I'm like, this is like, how could I ever be so lucky? But for people, I, all I can say from a personal experience, from a chronic health that was definitely amplified and hidden by my amount of drinking, I just think people, if people are struggling, I, the, the things that we block us from living this life have to go away. I mean, if it's a problem for you. I'm not saying people stop drinking, I mean, ever, I would never. But the things that are the repeated thing, and I would pray for this miracle, please God, let, the, let my bottom not be something I can't recover from. Like I knew my whole life, I'm, going, I'm in dangerous territory every time. And I prayed and prayed and I'm really lucky. Um, but I don't. It's like all I can say is nothing. Nothing good will come if you keep keep doing that. If behavior. you keep drinking, if you keep knocking out with pill, whatever it is that people do. I don't know, you know, all the ways of addiction, but it is truly. It's so prevalent in all these kids. My own child. He woke up last night. He is not drinking that I know of. I would know, but right, because I, because I, I follow him everywhere. But um, no, he he woke up at night and started like crying about something and then said, mom, hand me my phone. I knew he was sleep talking and I handed him the phone. I'm just watching. He says I'm critical. So I didn't even say anything to the sleeping boy asking the phone, 10 years old. And then he has it backwards and he starts scrolling on it. Backwards. Like he's not even looking, it's just so, 
And I thought, we're in this incredible place that I've dreamed of coming since I was 24. I used to have a place in Snowmass. But I was like, okay, like let's, let's enjoy something really incredible. And my son has been really on this thing, and it's really killing me. This thing that it's not as damaging as an alcohol spending my life that, but it's a checkout, and it's a popular thing. But to see that in the night, I was like, oh, mama, you are not free. You got you to gotta figure now out you can how to engage my child. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to wrap with this so we can get to your questions. You say, when I was diagnosed with MS, my life finally did markedly change. I became kind of a face for the disease. I am an advocate for something that matters to me. Though it's a role I never thought I would play, it has become who I am. The community of people I've found who have found me have comforted me. They see the real me and accept me as I am, weak, raw, humble, dependent, free, honest, sensitive, scared, hopeful. The mean baby is still there, but her edges are softer, wiser, kinder. Thank you. It's like a metamorphosis. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> and I know that labels stick, you know, mean baby or manic or whatever. And we know as parents, when you sometimes you label the child, it almost seems like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Can I give you another label? Please. So everyone I talked to who bumped into you in the lobby, one of my colleagues who's interviewed you before, do you know what label they give you? What? Lovely. I always wanted that. Thank you. Lovely. I always wanted that. It's the thing I wanted my whole life. You got it. Someone to say, oh, Selma, she's sweet. She's a sweet. Not once in my life. This was the first time someone ever said to me, always, I cannot tell you. My entire life, if someone I heard, they say, oh, Gina, Salma, or Blair, they go, oh, yeah. Mm -mm. She's crazy, right? Oh. That girl's crazy. They, we always say that. And I'd go, why crazy? Because I over talk or whatever. You know, I did. I was like, explain. I'm like a yenta. I'm a Jew. I'm an over. I'm a drinker. I'm a gen and tonic wasp. Like, explain something that'll be a context for Look people at me. to make sense. And that means Lovely. so much. Lovely. Thank you. And it means so much. <laughs> OK. <laughs> So with that said, we have about 12 minutes or so for questions. How are we going to do this? Woo. OK, let's start there. I'm just going to give you a workout. So I'm going to make you burn. Like, I'm going to give you a here. No, I'm just kidding. OK. Hi. Thank you so much for this. I really, um, when you talk about like people losing their lives, I think that's so important to not forget. And I, like, I'm sure a lot of people in this room have family members who have struggled with alcohol addiction. I have family members with MS. Um, so I really, really appreciate you. Thank you so this. much. I'm the question that I had for you was, uh, you talked about shame, and I think that's a big part of alcoholism. Certainly it was for my personal experience and my family. And I wonder um, if you have any anything that you learned about shame, like any tips mm. for overcoming it, or, or mm. what was a light bulb moment for you to get past that personally? Mm. <sighs> when I experienced the most shame I could of, you know, you know, losing, being in a blackout in front of a child, um, there might have been more extreme things that happened in my life that were horrifying or that I would be ashamed of, you know, certain rapes or going into certain situations, not once, a few times. I mean, things that you go, oh, you, you're crazy, like they said. Like, why is this person still doing this thing that is going to destroy them? I didn't know any better until the biggest shame came. The one thing that I was given as a job to be a mom, that there's this child, and that I had repeated, finally, it was doing push-ups. Like, they say, like, you know, and I had sobriety, this and there, and oh, I drink, I don't, I don't, you know, go sober not, and I'd try until it's hard. And that was one. I still get, I mean, it's just that beautiful boy. And then I scare people, and oh, his father, who I really didn't like at the time, that's why I drank. But that time I was scared, but that that man did not report me to Child Protective Services, that he didn't try and take my child away. We were in custody stuff, it was all stressful that he gave me the grace mm. to not make it irrevocable. Mm. 
Grace. I mean, that was huge. And the person that for brief moments I saw as the enemy, because anyone in any custody or divorce is probably not going to bring out the best in anyone. And it was fleeting and it was, and looking back, it was all fine. But that he allowed me to be with my son saying that I must absolutely work on this was the hugest gift my child's father could have given me and that gave me permission to say I can do this if he can trust me with the thing he loves the most then I will let go of this shame and not keep repeating it for God's mm, sake that's good that's good and that that's was huge one. that was huge for me so people giving you a real responsibility meant something that's good another question See, does anybody have any other questions? We have one. Oh, sorry. We're going to make you run. Oh, no, we have a mic right there. She's coming behind you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you. I've been wanting to meet you in person for a while. I have MS as well. I also have uh, these now eight, uh, eight-year-old mm -hmm. son. Um, and I'm curious to know how you talk to Arthur, right? Mm -hmm. How do you explain um, your situation to him and how to make it childlike enough that he understands kind of the ups and downs, the flares. That right. Mm. You know, it, when I first found out uh, that I had MS and I was in a bad place, so you, I finally found out because it was bad enough that I just, it was, I, I, he, he asked if it was something that was going to kill me and I thought, um, no, not for me, this probably won't be it's not an immediate danger, and that was all he cared about. Then it, none of it mattered, like my voice or anything. It really can go in and out. The thing that I feel the worst about is the chronic fatigue, the lassitude. I think part of the reason I get kind of so manic, and um, maybe not manic's the right word, so like kind of wired, and because it's very hard for me to stay awake. Because if I low, low my level, I will fall asleep in front of you. I mean, it will just go. I just am, and um, that's the hardest thing with him. That I get a moment and I say, oh, it's relaxed. I just want to be with you. And I'm out. Mm. And I cry. Like, that is, like, that is, feels a big failure. And that's probably why he's on the video thing so much. And, and I'm, I am failing at this. I'm not failing. Not failing. That's not what I mean. Thank you. Thank you for all my respect. Yeah, like, blah, blah, blah. Another failing. mom's like, no, no. I am not a leader in knowing how to be a mom that is chronically tired. But I tell him I'm, you know, I want him to be with me as much as possible. The dog became almost a family dog. He's definitely a service dog, a real one, because I take him everywhere. He has to follow the rules. But Arthur, it was another way for me to reach Arthur. He didn't want to hear my reasons or life or appreciate things right now he doesn't he has no interest in what I have to say in that way other than I'm not dying right away so he's relatively safe so um the dog I mean animals things you know it's I do whatever I can to bolster any energy Arthur and I have together but it is it's um I'm it's harder with his friends they don't get it he's mm -hmm. used to me but the friends come over they're like why is your mom like fine and then she's like Frankenstein because like, they'll be so big, and I'm okay. Like, they're not being cruel, but, you know, I can tell people get, you know, just curious. Yeah, that's fair. I think I'm a talker. <laughs> Let yeah. them know everything that's going on. That's good. <laughs> I, I want to make yeah, sure you know. we get in something that I, I wanted. To, you have a, a <laughs> new uh, project, or not a project, but to, uh, the guide. Yes, I, I am get that the in. chief creative officer yes. of a beauty line. It's called Guide Beauty, and it was, um, it's inclusive. And what does that mean? This is such a great thing for, you know, obviously a place with ideas. But so this whole time, you know, feeling in the muck and then counting a lot on the disability, disability community to teach me things about how to take care of myself, just in general, because I kind of missed a lot of that in life. And they're pros, the ones that are thriving that have, you know, disabilities are used to extending a lot more energy to get through their days. And so there was, I was like, wait, yeah, um, I can't do my makeup anymore. I, because you know, shape? a lot of people, well, I used to, it all changes, like in the beginning, I didn't have use of me, my right side well, but then I guess once like a big part of the flare like went down, then my right side's fine, like really fine, and switched to my left side, but I just, it's kind of like high end, like I'll throw stuff, oh, it's a little, little bit part, 
Gunsonian-ish, but so, so I can't, so it's hard to hold a tool. So these tools, it's like the thing on the back of your cell phone. So it's a makeup applicator that you can hold like just, you know, like that. And so I don't have to deal with it. And it was invented by this woman, Terry, um, that's my, you know, that, that has park that makeup artist, Parkinson's. And she went home and she's like, ah, how I can't do this anymore. And so it's like shorter brushes. I can do it on myself, this wand. It just, it becomes an extension. And I didn't realize, again, it seems very um, small, but like it's small, but there's a reason why the beauty industry is a big deal, or clothing. It's the way we present ourselves. And, and I really disappear without a face of makeup. My mom always said, just wear stage makeup. It doesn't matter what they say. <laughs> just wear it around. And she really meant it. You know, she saw me in a school play. She's like, you look great. And you're like, and, but mom, I have all, all this and makeup. And I said, it's pancake makeup. And like, you know, and she's like, perfect. I looked like the sheet she of paper from like Boyd's Cosmetics you used to get when they teach like my mom, you know, and they'd show how, yeah, where yeah, to put it. Yeah. And I looked like it before you rub it in, you know, but it looked great <laughs> and from far away. So I kind of do that. It's like my eccentricity, just more is more to keep going. But the point is like, but I couldn't some, do it and yeah. makeup, it's like, why don't we have universal tools? We've had the same old pencils. I, I got like a corneal abrasion. There's things you don't consider until you're with people that's disabilities might be more marked than mine all the time because I'm very kind of lucky maybe that I shift a lot. But makeup was off the thing. Hair was off the thing. You're like raising my hands. You know, I'll, it'll trigger. I get triggered. It changes all the time and that's hard for people because they don't, you know, again, that belief thing. So then I just put it in good things. Like how do we get, how do we get makeup on us? That's good. We have, <laughs> we have time for one, maybe one or two more. One more, two more. Thank you for being here and sharing you. your story. Um, I really identified with you when you were talking about going from doctor to doctor to doctor to try to get diagnoses. For 12 years, yeah. I did the same thing, and finally a rheumatologist diagnosed me. And it's really, it is life-changing, and I cried too, kind of like you. It's, you know, what can we do to try to change that in the healthcare system because it is so frustrating and I talk to so many people who maybe don't have the kind of good insurance that I have or maybe right. don't get really angry and say, I'm gonna keep going, I'm gonna keep pursuing this and it's exhausting. I mean, I went through ebbs and flows of I'm gonna pursue this and then I had to take a year or two off because it's too exhausting to pursue it. What can we do to change that healthcare system? Because I feel like as a woman, there is something that, you know, is, is it in your mind? I had people say that. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, it, it's, it's probably unconventional, but I learned I can't act anything like myself when I go to the doctor. Mm. I can't act anything like myself when I go to a new doctor because it's a lot, you know, I just have a lot. Like I'm just that person that, you know, and, and I have to go in with my list that I want to be clear. Mm. And I, you have to know what you're going to need. Everyone loves, you know, I, I didn't go to work. I, it was hard to go back to work. And then a producer said, no, everything, everyone has something. And so I got really clear. I hired someone, uh, Levant Consulting. It's, it's learning to deal with disability with um, confidence, talking mm. about it. Because I didn't know. Because I never considered myself someone with a disability. I was like, sorry, I'm taking up space. Sorry, I'm sleeping again. Sorry, I'm every You know, it was really ugly and weird. So, I'm sorry, I totally scared you. Oh, look, so, I know. <laughs> on it. Oh, that's so I, I was an actress, I didn't get big. But the, so, so um, I, had to, I have to, doctors uh, don't have time. They can't listen to my life story of a trauma that hurt me at some age and maybe it's connected. I had to just go in, this has happened. I don't know why it never occurred to me to never ask about an MRI, but how do you know? So if you don't feel well, I, that's my big, biggest suggestion, and even the MSAA says, especially for women, ask for an MRI. If this has been going on a long time, if this chronic fatigue, if this, you know, I was seven years old researching, I thought I had yuppie flu. Like, cause that's what was in the newspaper. Like, why you're tired? I'm like, I have yuppie flu. Like, I just, why am I like this? But you have to, you have to ask for the things that'll make them, and they'll say, no, you don't need it. Why would you need it? You're fine. Give me a Romberg test, dude, and give me an MRI. And I could have been out of here 20 years ago not wasting my money in the medical communities. And a man, again, love men, but there's something I think in the way they present mm. <laughs> that might not try and um, sure. 
that a shows entertain it. people. Like there's things I do that aren't helping my cause when I go to a doctor. And we have to take responsibility for people that might be like me or to mitigate because you've been called crazy or whatever. You have to really just be concrete and say, I know you, we got 10 minutes here. I need this MRI, what do I do? I can't walk, this isn't, I don't think it's sciatica. So good. You know, it's don't be afraid because that's what men do and that's how they get an MRI unless they're in an ultra shock, you know. And I'm not, not every man, every woman, this is a big dumb generality, but, no, but it's we get true it. that women they, have the a hard time getting diagnosed. Absolutely. Isn't she wonderful? <laughs> Seriously. You have been so wonderful. I will admit, look, I talk for a living, and I was a little nervous. I'm like, okay, I hope she likes me. I hope we get along. And then we met in the elevator, and it's just been such I mean, a good day. A bit of a loose cannon, but I think that, um, I think you, you know, but when I, you know, it was the same part of me that was a functioning alcoholic. There's a part of me that knows you got it. You, you play by the rules of the society, you know. Got and, it, girl. And um, to have the alcohol part removed and to have some understanding with people, I mean, it's, I, I hope we have wonderful, incredible future days for all of us. Amen to that. The book is Mean Baby. It's so good. So you can get your copies. Are you going to sign some books? Yes. Okay, please. she's going to sign some books. Please get this book. It's really, really worth the read. God bless you guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much.